Church. Here are the announcements for this week. Would you like to receive the parish bulletin and announcements electronically? St. Thomas is pleased to announce that we will now have an option to get parish updates through email or text. Please see the flyer on the table in the gathering space for more details. Our Lenten fish fry dinners continue this Friday at 5.30 p.m., followed by a reflection on Christ's passion and the Stations of the Cross at 7 p.m. Our special guest celebrant for Stations will be Bishop Stephen Reka. Please come to meet and listen to the Shepherd of our Diocese. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to St. Thomas the Apostle Catholic Church. Tonight, we are celebrating the liturgy for the fourth Sunday in Lent, also known as Laetare Sunday. The readings can be found in the green hymnal at number 894. As a reminder before Mass begins, please take a minute to check your electronic devices and place them on silent. Our celebrant tonight is our pastor, Father Jantz. Please rise and join in our gathering song, Number 719, What Wondrous Love Is This?
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Once again, a good evening and welcome to everyone as we celebrate this fourth Sunday of Lent. We're right around the halfway point of our Lenten journey, and already our hearts and minds start to tor- turn towards the celebration of Easter. And so as we set out on this next phase of, the, phase of the journey, brothers and sisters, let us begin by turning to the Lord and asking His strength to walk next to Him faithfully. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. O God, who through your word reconcile the human race to yourself in a wonderful way, grant, we pray, that with prompt devotion and eager faith, the Christian people may hasten toward the solemn celebrations to come. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have removed the reproach of Egypt from you. While the Israelites were encamped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th of the month. On the day after the Passover, they ate of the produce of the land in the form of unleavened cakes and parched grain. On that same day after the Passover, on which they ate of the produce of the land, the manna ceased. No longer was there manna for the Israelites, who that year ate of the yield of the land of Canaan. The word of the Lord. Together extol his name. 
sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Look to him that you might be radiant with joy, and your faces may not blush with shame. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress he saved him. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them Jesus addressed this parable. A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, 
A severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens, who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat, but here am I, dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, Quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. I'll start off this homily with a little bit of a confession, or maybe a little bit of an admission, you might say. You see, for me as a guy, it always feels a bit weird to go out into public wearing pink. <laughs> now, over the years, every now and again, I've seen other men wearing pink a little bit. For some reason, back in college, it seems like pink, sh pink shorts and navy blue shirts were a thing. But you'd have thought that going into a line of work where you have to wear black every day would have saved me from having to wear a color I prefer to call rose ever again in my life. And I guess the woman in my life, Holy Mother Church, had other ideas. I guess the church calendar is somewhat merciful to us priests to limit the rose to just two weekends out of the year, but it just so happens that today is one of those weekends. So maybe it's a good idea to talk right now about why we pull out these rose-colored glasses, you might say, twice a year in the Catholic Church. For today's iteration, at least, the reason is, is that we've arrived at a very big milestone. We're right around the halfway mark between Ash Wednesday and Easter. So we use a color that reflects that. Because if you think about it, rose is about halfway between red and white. Believe it or not, those aren't just colors for college football. You see, in the church's visual language, the grammar of our worship, red is a reminder for us of Jesus' blood that was shed on the cross, which is one of our major focuses during Lent with the stations and all. But white reminds us of the new day of the resurrection that we'll celebrate in just a few weeks. So here at the halftime show, you might say, of Lent, right between Ash Wednesday and Easter, it's time for us to break out the rose color and get excited for the upcoming celebration. 
Now, the best way to be excited for a party is to put some energy into planning it, and there's always a few things you have to do when you're planning some kind of an event. First, you have to find a place. Unfortunately, we've already got a great spot for that here at the church. Second, you have to get some food ready somehow, even if it's just calling the pizza delivery guy. And for us here at the Catholic Church, thank God, the Lord himself takes care of that one by a miracle each week. But thirdly, and maybe most important of all, you have to send out the invitations and get people together. In other words, to have a proper celebration, to plan for a good party, you have to gather. Now the scriptures give us a couple great angles today to talk about this idea of gathering, which I've put out as one of the big ideas of the Lenten season. The first reading we heard gives us a pretty obvious setup for it. It talks about the moment when the people of Israel, after they left Egypt, after had just finished up their 40 years of wandering through the desert, their 40 years of struggle and hunger, and they crossed over the River Jordan and finally entered to that land that God had promised them so many years ago. And the very first thing that they did when they got there, as the book of Joshua tells us, was to sit down together for a big feast. It says they celebrated the Passover, and the day after, they ate of the produce of the land. The tribes of Israel would later be spread out over that whole land, and they certainly had a lot of work to do before it would truly be theirs. But at that moment when they entered into it, they started it off by coming together to celebrate. You see, this idea of gathering for celebration is a common theme throughout all of Scripture, and it comes from a very basic human, ex human experience. When we sit down to celebrate and eat with people, we form relationships with them. One of my best memories of my years of living in Rome was the way an evening at a nice restaurant would always go down there. You see, here in the States, if you go out to eat in a restaurant, usually what happens is the waiters give you a menu to eat while you're being seated, and then they quickly come back to get you drinks and take your order. The food comes, you eat, and once the plates are empty, even if the waiting staff is trying to be very polite, you can almost feel that pressure to go ahead and clear out from the table and get on down the road so that they can turn that table over to another group of folks. But in most of the rest of the world, and especially in Italy, when you get a table in a restaurant, it's just kind of assumed that you're going to be there all night. Because coming together at a table, especially for a nice meal, is about more than just getting food into our stomachs. It's an opportunity for us to get to know people, to develop a relationship with them. In other words, gathering to celebrate is truly the deepest sense of that word, to gather. So with that in mind, I think we're in a good place to learn a few lessons from today's gospel. The famous story that Jesus told about the prodigal son, about his loving father, and about his secretly jealous older brother. But the story started off with kind of the opposite of gathering with a son who decided to cut off his ties from his family and run off. And it ends with that same son coming back and feasting with his family, but everything that happens in the middle and around that story is absolutely fascinating. You see, the parable tells us about both brothers, and it's clear that neither of them really knows, really understands their father. It's obvious that the younger brother doesn't get it, he was feeling stifled maybe by being too close to home and decided to strike out on his own as far away as he possibly could with part of his father's estate. You have to imagine there from the description in scripture that the door barely missed hitting him as he ran on out. He knew so little about his father that later when he was dying of starvation and thinking about going back, he started to plan this little speech. Well, I know dad's not going to accept me back as a son after everything that I've done. After all, the whole asking for my inheritance was pretty rude and wasting it was even worse. But maybe if I apologize, he'll hire me. Never imagining that the whole time the father was waiting for him. As the scripture says, while he was still far off, his father saw him, which meant that every single day his father had been waiting, had been watching, had been praying that he would come walking down that road. Never imagining that he would never even get past those first three words of that little speech he'd planned before the hug hit. 
But it's also clear that the older brother really doesn't know his father all that well either. He gets all caught up about his rights and lets loose this tirade of accusations against his father's goodwill when his, father, when his younger brother finally comes back. Okay, Dad, all this time I've done every single thing you've asked me to do, and I never even got a regular paycheck. So why are you going to throw a party for this good for nothing? You'll notice how his way of thinking really, in the end, isn't that much different from his younger brother's way of thinking, because he also clearly thinks of himself as an employee more than as a son. You see, even though the two brothers made different mistakes in their lives, they had the same misunderstanding, thinking about their connection with their father, with their family, like it was a transaction instead of a relationship, like it was labor instead of love. But I have to imagine that both of them had to have come around after this incident when they saw their father's love in action. The younger son experienced a feast held in his honor right after nearly dying of hunger. And the older son heard his father's kind and generous words of reassurance and encouragement just when he was at his absolute lowest. And not surprisingly as well, the big moment of reconciliation happened when the family came together again for a feast, when they gathered to celebrate. So with this idea of gathering as part of Lent in the back of our heads, I think we can take away two ideas today based on the attitudes of each of the brothers. So let's start with the younger son and imagine how his experiences often match our own pattern of behavior with God. How often we ourselves come here to church to this, our father's house, because we feel like the rest of our life is messed up. And we get embarrassed about how we are, how we've made a total hash of everything and been irresponsible with our choices and decisions. And we can kind of feel sometimes like we won't or we won't get or we won't deserve the full treatment of love that we know God offers. The younger son today, I think, speaks to those moments when we need to reconcile with God, when we need to trust in his goodness and mercy. There's an old tradition in the Catholic Church, and it's a very good one, I think, for us to make a confession at least once a year. And sometimes even more often than that is usually a good idea. Because this side of heaven, every single one of us has got sins to work through, has got ways we need to grow, and the sacrament of reconciliation is one of the greatest pieces of help that God has given us to do just that. Because in that sacrament, we come to him like the younger son, and our heavenly father surprises us by what he says and does, surprises us with his welcome, his forgiveness. And to be frank, we're only surprised just because we don't know him all that well, because we don't say, I'm sorry, often enough. So if you feel like you've been needing some mercy, needing some grace in your life, you're invited. I'll mention in particular our parish penance service upcoming on April the 7th from 6 p.m. to as long as we need. And then there's also the usual Saturday afternoon slots from 4 to 5. Everyone is invited to take advantage of those loving and open arms of our Heavenly Father. And to come at the idea of gathering from the perspective of the older of the two brothers, I I think there's also a need for us to be intentional about coming together for quieter and less dramatic moments as a parish family. There's those times when, as a community, we have a chance to see the Father's love in and through our fellow Catholics, and it's really important to take advantage of that. Because if not, even if we've been obediently going through the motions, things are going to get a little dry underneath. Even if we do what the Father asks us to do, if we don't feel a need to seek out a relationship with our spiritual family, we won't be receiving the fullness of love that he offers us, the fullness of that celebration with the fatted calf in the story. So as the pandemic dies down a little bit, at least for the moment, and we have a chance to move back towards fuller community life, I'd especially like to offer out two invitations in the coming weeks. First, I'd like to renew the invitation to our Lenten fish fries the next two, sun, two Fridays at 5.30 p.m., followed by Stations of the Cross at 7. We've been having a great turnout so far, but as Alan would remind everyone, the Knights make plenty of fish for everyone to come. We'd love to see you all there. 
For this next week, our guest speaker is going to be Bishop Reka, so there's also a great opportunity to get to see the heart of our diocesan shepherd a little bit. And then the week after that, our youth group, happily present with us here tonight, will be doing living stations of the cross, and I know everyone's very excited to see that. As a second opportunity for gathering, I'd also like to plug a little bit the liturgies of Holy Week. It's 7 p.m. on Holy Thursday and Good Friday, plus the great vigil of Easter at 8 p.m. on the Saturday before Easter. All of them are amazing experiences of grace, where we come together as a community to be changed and transformed by the mysteries that have saved us, where, like the people of Israel gathered at the edge of the Jordan, we come together to celebrate God's loving care throughout our wanderings. And I think that's a pretty good spot to leave things as we enjoy a moment of community celebration today and take a bit of a deep breath in advance of things getting heavier in the weeks to come. So whether you're feeling more today like the prodigal son or maybe like his stay-at-home brother, our Heavenly Father welcomes each and every one of us today with open arms of love. Let's walk the road of community and relationship, intentionally gathering as part of our shared faith in these coming weeks as we continue our preparations as a parish family for the celebration of Easter with the joy of minds made pure. Brothers and sisters, let us profess our faith in the merciful love of God our Father, as shown in the life, death, and resurrection of his Son, Jesus. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. My brothers and sisters, with words and deeds, with teaching and parable, God revealed his love for us in the story of his son Jesus. With confidence in his love, let us pray now for our community and the people of the entire world. Our prayer response is, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, hear our prayer. For Pope Francis, Bishop Stephen Reicha, and all those who serve our church, that they may be ministers of reconciliation and models of forgiveness, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For nations and governments of the world, that they may be committed to the protection and just distribution of the Earth's resources, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the synod process in our diocese, that our local synod actions will continue to be guided by the Holy Spirit, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the entire St. Thomas Parish community, that all may find a place of welcome and hope in our midst, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. 
for those living in Eastern Europe, and especially in Ukraine, that God will provide the courage, fortitude, and grace to overcome the difficulties of war. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those in our parish book of intentions, the sick, the homebound, the incarcerated, all members of St. Thomas, the men and women of the armed forces, and their families, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the uh, happy repose of the soul of Jan Martin, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all of our beloved dead, that they may share in the glory of Jesus' resurrection, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving Father, with open arms, you tenderly welcome all of us who have strayed from you. Hear our prayers for our brothers and sisters, for the whole human family, and unite us all in the communion of your love through Christ our Lord. Please join in our presentation song number 680, Amazing Grace. We'll sing verses 1, 4, and 5. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that this, my sacrifice and yours, may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. We place before you with joy these offerings which bring eternal remedy, O Lord, praying that we may both faithfully revere them and present them to you as is fitting for the salvation of all the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just that we should always give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for you do not cease to spur us on to possess a more abundant life. And being rich in mercy, you constantly offer pardon 
and called on sinners to trust in your forgiveness alone. Never did you turn away from us, and though time and again we have broken your covenant, you have bound the human family to yourself through Jesus, your Son, our Redeemer, with a new bond of love so tight that it can never be undone. Even now you set before your people a time of grace and reconciliation. And as they turn back to you in spirit, you grant them hope in Christ Jesus and a desire to be of service to all while they entrust themselves more fully to the Holy Spirit. And so, filled with wonder, we extol the power of your love and proclaiming our joy at the salvation that comes from you. We join in the heavenly hymn of countless hosts as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and from the world's beginning are ceaselessly at work, so that the human race may become holy, just as you yourself are holy. Look, we pray upon your people's offerings, and pour out on them the power of your Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we too are your sons and daughters. Indeed, though we once were lost and could not approach you, you loved us with the greatest love. For your Son, who alone is just, handed himself over to death and did not disdain to be nailed for our sake to the wood of the cross. But before his arms were outstretched between heaven and earth to become the lasting sign of your covenant, he desired to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. As he ate with them, he took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, knowing that he was about to reconcile all things in himself through his blood to be shed on the cross. He took the chalice, filled with the fruit of the vine, and once more giving you thanks, handed the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of your Son, Jesus Christ, 
who is our Passover and our surest peace. We celebrate his death and resurrection from the dead, and looking forward to his blessed coming, we offer you, who are our faithful and merciful God, this sacrificial victim who reconciles to you the human race. Look kindly, most compassionate Father, on those you unite to yourself by the sacrifice of your Son, and grant that by the power of the Holy Spirit, as they partake of this one bread and one chalice, they may be gathered into one body in Christ, who heals every division. Be pleased to keep us always in communion of mind and heart, together with Francis our Pope and Stephen our Bishop. Help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom until the hour when we stand before you, saints among the saints in the halls of heaven, with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with St. Joseph, her spouse, the blessed apostles, St. Thomas, and all the saints, and with our deceased brothers and sisters, whom we humbly commend to your mercy. Then, freed at last from the wound of corruption and made fully into a new creation, we shall sing to you with gladness the thanksgiving of Christ, who lives for all eternity. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At our Savior's command, and formed by his divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold, him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. O oh God, who enlighten everyone who comes into this world, illuminate our hearts, we pray, with the splendor of your grace, that we may always ponder what is worthy and pleasing to your majesty, and love you in all sincerity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And Bow down for the blessing. Look upon those who call to you, O Lord, and sustain the weak. Give life by your unfailing light to those who walk in the shadow of death, and bring those rescued by your mercy from every evil to reach the highest good. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Please join in our closing hymn number 692, I Heard the Voice of Jesus. Sorry.